he's a man that has seen it all. I had a confrontation with the National Assembly once. Very passionate about issues that affect society. A senator asked me, are you tired of your job? And I said to him, my name is Senusi Lamido Senusi, not CBN government. I just want to know a little bit about your antecedents, your birth. When were you born? What were those things that affected you growing up? I was born in Kano, 1961. I was born into the Kano royal family. My grandfather, the Emir Mohammed Senussi, was the 11th Fulani Emir of Kano. He named me after himself, and he abdicated the throne in 1963 when I was barely two years old. I spent my early years in Lagos. My father was then here in Lagos in the Prime Minister's office as director of research, basically doing the intelligence work from the Ministry of External Affairs. On my mother's side, my mother comes from a long line of religious scholars, uh, and they're all either imams or qadis, okay, Sharia court judges, so from background of scholarship. Assalamu alaikum. When my father was going abroad, at that time, my parents had separated. There was this big decision he had to make, which was whether to take me with him or leave me in Nigeria. And members of his family were generally concerned about a prince being taken out to Europe, where he might grow up and not learn about his religion, not learn about Islam, not be able to read the Quran, and be totally disconnected from his culture. So he took the difficult decision to leave his children in Nigeria. And I went to one of his uncles, al Haj Muhammad Inouda, who, had been, who was then Minister of Defense. So I was there until 1966 when the coup happened and the Wada family moved to Kano, we moved to Kano. And shortly after that, I was enrolled at St. Anne's Primary School, which is a Catholic uh, primary school in Kaduna, at the age of eight, a boarding school, from where I went on to King's College and then ABU. So I've been shaped by so many influences. The fortune of having these influences, my father, Alhajin Oida, the Emir of Kano, and my mother's family um, growing up. I have um, learned uh, the importance of um, the extended family. A lot of these subtle influences have influenced my life. They've influenced my thoughts, influenced my attitude towards friendship. Uh, being in St. Anne's and King's College has shaped my worldview around the country, around ethnicity, around religion, around merit. So many of the core ideas that I think have defined me in my professional life were acquired from those early, um, early years um, in my life. Real quickly, I just want to focus quickly on your family now. Tell me a little bit about your family. It's a very traditional family. Um, I have four wives. And the first two were related to me, one on my father's side, one on my mother's side. And the third uh, is a friend, uh, uh, is a lawyer. The, the fourth, a princess from a family that's close to my family. My children, I've been blessed with 13 children, eight of them are girls, one of, the, one of them is a baby. Like my father, my principal focus with all of them has been to say, go get educated. You know, and, that's, and, and they know that that's the most important thing. I've brought my children to understand that um, they cannot just see themselves as, oh, I'm the son of the governor of Central Bank, I'm the son of an MA. It's, you're, you're nothing, you know, you, you go and be something. My first son decided uh, on graduation, um, he, he'd read accounting at Buckingham. He said that he wanted to join the police. I was surprised. So he's an ASP in the police, uh, but he's going in September to Leicester to do a master's in police studies. For the girls, uh, the, the older ones have all gone through their master's degrees. Uh, some are married. Uh, I have, I'm have. i a grandfather now. Uh, oh, I, 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 two of my daughters are married with my son, and they've got, all got children. Uh, and left. The younger ones are coming up. Uh, I have. Uh, so this year, in the, I'll be in the UK doing a PhD, but six of my children will be in the UK. 
Okay, I have uh, two completing a master's, one completing a bachelor's degree all in this year. And I've got one on in A-levels and two would be undergraduate. So uh, basically that's my life. So the whole family is in school? Yeah, that, that's, that's <laughs> everybody's in school. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I'm doing the PhD is also to let them know that they've got no excuse. Mm. Uh, you know, if I at 60 am going to start a PhD, all of you had better start applying. That's amazing, uh, starting a PhD at 60? Yeah. My father was always rather different uh, uh, from me. I mean, he was a prince. He was the crown prince of Kano. He was Chiroma. Mm. But he grew up more or less without an interest in Pinanemia. He never really, even though he had the title of Chiroma of Kano, he never really had uh, an interest or an ambition to be the Emir. Now, he knew that I had an interest in it. And he never, he never stopped me. Uh, but he always said to me, you can't sit you, you you're not you, you don't put it in your head first of all you can't guarantee that you'll be there mm. secondly you can't just sit waiting for somebody to die mm -hmm. <laughs> wait maybe yeah? so in the interim you've got to go and do something and he said to me focus on your education focus on a career be something what i would like is that you do not end up as the son of ambassador senusi i would like you to be something in your own right so i remember when i became ceo of first bank when i became governor of central bank I said, Alhamdulillah, this is what my father wanted for me. Uh, people, mm. people talk to me as a chief executive, as the first Northern Nigerian chief executive of First Bank. So I was the governor of Central Bank. And later as Amir of Kano. So you, you've risen above being the son of ABC. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though we're proud of what they did, they're giants, we wrote on their shoulders. Uh, we would not be here without them. But uh, the idea was break away from this sense that I am the son of this person. Yes. I was born into this family. You know, it's um, it's, it's nothing. And, and, and I've seen too many of my relatives, too many of my cousins and princes who are nothing mm. other than that they were born to this Amir or born to this. And if you take that away from them, they're nothing. You, you know, in 2012, as governor of the Central Bank, I got the Bankers Committee to declare that year the year of the woman in banking. And we issued a number of guidelines. Among them were that the banks would strive in every recruitment exercise to ensure that at least 50% of those that they recruited were women. That banks would actively seek to promote at least 40% of management positions to be held by women. And that banks would try to have at least 30% of board positions held by women. The central bank was established in 1959. I became governor in 2009. In 50 years, only four women had made director in the central bank. I appointed eight female directors in one year. We basically took areas where men had dominated and monopolized and put women there. And those women proved that they could do this job as well and even better than the men. And we empowered them. I hold the view that um, women issues, gender issues in Nigeria go beyond these elite issues of women directors at CBN or directors on banks or bank MDs. You realize that the vulnerability of women is a matter that needs to be put front and center uh, of political discourse. I was sitting receiving these reports and there were all these um, women who were waiting and I heard a very loud scream. So I asked them to go and check. And the person who checked came back with tears in his eyes. And what had happened? A woman who had just walked across this children's hospital about 200 meters away from the palace just across. And her child was sick and she had come to ask for money to go and buy the drugs. And while she was waiting for her turn to ask for support, the baby died in her arms. And how much was this? It was less than $5. This is what happens every day in this country. Children die because their parents cannot afford $5. So, that a mother will watch her child die because she does not have five dollars.
Let me quickly segue it into this. Girl child education, you've always been passionate about now. And then let's segue that into what you're doing with Girl Child, your SDG goals, and one million teachers. I mean, you had a great session with the president of Ghana, Nana Kufadu, and, and there was a other thing, he didn't just join. He stayed till the end, critiqued every project. They had finalists, you know. You will be advocating for some funding for that. I mean, how does that make you feel? I mean, look, the, the Ghanaian president is wonderful. And the, and, and the Prime Minister of Norway, and, and they're the co-chairs of, of the SDG advocates, and they have shown extremely profound leadership. And you've got others, you've got um, Jeffrey Sachs, who goes out, you know, and basically tells multinationals and governments in Europe the truth about what they're doing, uh, and how they have been part and parcel of the problems uh, that, that um, of underdevelopment historically. And, and a number of colleagues, um, as, that, as you, that you saw on that platform, you know, young people uh, who have been chosen by the UN Secretary General to be advocates um, uh, for SDGs. Um, and I've been focused on SDG 4, which is education, largely girl child education, SDG 5, which is gender equality, um, and SDG 8, which is um, about decent work. And this challenge was about teachers. Mm teachers who are actually involved in dealing with poor people in their communities. Show us what you are doing that um, provides education, that can give get education to underserved populations. Mm. And they came up with this. So you've got simple ideas, like people who are working on prisons, for example, to get people out. You've got people who are working on technical skills. You've got people who have, it's like the reader room, which is basically a mobile library that can be moved to a village and then children can be taught how to read, how to how to how to calculate, and so on. Now, when we have a proof of concept, then hopefully we can invite the governments, we can invite UNICEF, we can invite other people to come and say, this is a proof that this idea works. Simple ideas from the teachers themselves who, who engage, who work with with children. You've got someone um, who who's run a dyslexia center. Mm -hmm. I mean, dyslexics are totally ignored in our country. Yes. Okay, so. You know, so basically, there's a complex populations, underserved populations. You know, um, we try to we try to reach them. I'll segue this conversation into your book. So obviously, your book is a collection of writings over the years. What was the mind behind writing that book? First of all, I never set out to write a book. Okay, um, these are a collection of articles um, and and started as debates. After I came back from my studies in the Sudan, uh, this was at the height of the problems with General Abacham. Uh, the fact that Nigerians were tired of military rule, the fact that he had set up these political parties and he was determined to self-perpetuate. And if you picked any newspaper in Nigeria, the so-called Hausa Fulani were the evil people. They were the ones who were responsible for the destruction of Nigeria and so on. And it disturbed many of us, especially Northern progressives. And, and we had a meeting um, once in my house in Kano, and we had uh, Kabir Yusuf, who was the first editor and owner of the Weekly Trust and later Daily Trust. So Kabir Yusuf said, you know, I want to start a newspaper, but for the newspaper to really be effective, you guys have to write. Writing that expressed an opposition to dictatorship, um, support for democracy and progressive ideas from Northerners. For example, I, I was uh, opposed to the annulment of June 12th. Uh, I was uh, on the board of the Kudrat Initiative for Nigerian Democracy. So for me, this was how being a regular columnist started. Um, uh, basically a passion to express a view and to um, serve as a corrective to what I saw as a very unfair narrative. And that was how it started. Then we went through 1998 and then the run up to the 1999 elections. And of course, the, it was inescapable that there will be conversations around politics, around zoning, around um, whether the president should go, should go to the north or south. I was, of course, firmly opposed to any idea that simply changing where the president was from was going to change anything. My view was always the president, don't start asking where he's from. Ask what he can deliver, ask who he is, what is his background, what is his vision. So we got into those debates um, in the run up to democracy. And then after democracy, there, there was this big thing about the Sharia movement. Mm. The Sharia movement was for me um, 
ultimately political. And I believe in 1999, what happened with Obasanjo coming to power was that the northern Muslim political elite found itself for the first time completely out of it. They didn't have the economy, they didn't have the military, they didn't have the government. And I think the entire Sharia thing was basically taking advantage. I mean, it's, it's Karl Popper. You, you, you feel a sense yeah. of insecurity and then, and then you, you create an identity and, 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 and it becomes part of the negotiation for political space. And so Zamfara decided to declare Sharia. And what was, what was really declaration of Sharia in actual fact, it was nothing. It was just amending the Northern Nigerian Penal Code to introduce certain criminal punishments that had been taken out by the British. The Northern Nigerian Penal Code was always based on Islamic law. The, I mean, many people don't know that. The Northern Nigerian Penal Code uh, was brought by the British from the Sudan. And the Sudanese Code and the Indian Muslim Code were based on the Turkish Mujalla from, from the Ottoman Empire just amended to reflect Maliki law and not Hanafi law. So the Northern Nigerian Penal Code was always Sharia law. And the danger I saw from the very beginning was the elevation of religion to the major element in political discourse, diverted attention of people from the real issues of development. Mm. So governors who were supposed to provide development basically did not. Plus, um, many of the things that happened were actually a violation of Islamic law. And, and because I had a degree in Islamic law, I knew. And that's why um, I got involved in those debates. I criticized the amputation of the hand of a thief in, in Zamfara. I, I criticized the sentencing of women uh, to death uh, for adultery. And not because you cannot find those punishments in Islamic law, but because they were not being uh, applied in line with the law. Mm. And so that, that became a major part of the, of the book, of the, the, the debates. And naturally, when you challenge that, in a time when everybody was passionate and emotional, every Muslim was happy that he had Sharia, you're going to have debates with scholars. Uh, scholars came after me, uh, Muslims came after me, I was almost declared an apostate, and I kept, continue, I kept debating. Um, and now, uh, all the things I was saying at that time have turned out to be true, that the North is paying the price. And now, in September, when I write my PhD, I'm doing a PhD in law, and I'm actually writing on the codification of Muslim family law as an instrument of social reform. And I'm using this Muslim uh, code um, as, um, as a case study, and then comparing with the, uh, with, with the reforms um, in Morocco. So it's, it's, a, it's a subject that I've been engaged with and passionate about for decades, and it's something that I'm likely to remain engaged with for the rest of my life. Uh, all of this good work you've done, all of this advocacy ties around the economy of the nascent country we are in. And it ties around the economic ability, the social mobility, I mean, all of that conversation. The state of the Nigerian economy, I wouldn't forgive myself if I don't ask you about that. We're in a quagmire, we're deep in the dirt now as we speak. It, it looks as though with the state of the currency, the Naira, it has just been a gift that keeps giving since 1986, January. It's just been a slippery slope. What can we do? Okay, so let me give an idea of um, when, when we look at numbers, how, how bad things are. If you look at the World Bank development indicators, in 1980, on a PPP basis, our per capita GDP was, I believe, 2000 Two hundred and twenty-nine dollars in nineteen in twenty fourteen. It had risen to three thousand and ninety-nine dollars, a fifty percent rise. In twenty nineteen, our GDP per capita on a PPP basis was down to two thousand one hundred and eighty. Notice two thousand one hundred eighty in nineteen eighty, two thousand two hundred twenty-nine in nineteen in twenty nineteen. Now at this rate, by twenty twenty-three on a per capita basis, PPP, we will be back where we were in 1980. Mm. We have been set back 40 years. I mean, and, and you look at the fall. I mean, between 2014 and 2019, all the gains made in 35 years, between 1980 and 2014, were wiped out. This is, this is what tells you where we are. And, and, these, and, these, and these are numbers that are there. 
when we talk about huge devaluations or high rates of inflation and low rates of um, GDP growth and um, excessive rates of population growth, all of these factors come in into that number because your, the rate of growth, if your population is growing faster than your GDP, your per capita income goes down anyway even if nothing happened to inflation rates and, and, and exchange rates. Now, when you compound that with high rates of inflation and high rates of devaluation, then on a dollar basis, the rate of collapse is huge. And that's what we've had in the last five years. We've had growth that has been outstripped by population growth. You've had inflation that's in the upper double digits, and you've had massive devaluation of the currency. And that has wiped out all the work that was done in the 35 years prior to 2015. To my mind, we had decisions that should have been taken in 2015, 2016, should have been taken actually much earlier. Remember in 2011, we had this big debate over the removal of fuel subsidy. That has been a major problem. I have been screaming about this for over a decade. It's unsustainable. Uh, even if um, this was all subsidy, you were, you were subsidizing consumption. Totally, I, I, do, I have never understood why we believe that for the poor people of this country, giving them cheap petrol is more important than giving them education or giving them health care, because that's what it is. I mean, you, these things are about choice. You're taking money, you know, out of education, taking money out of health care, taking money out of infrastructure, and putting it in subsidizing the importation of petroleum products that will make profits and create jobs in England and France, who were the major countries exporting petroleum products to us, and all producing country, by the way, which cannot fix its own refineries. I believe that we had a great opportunity when we had a change in government to put this economy on reset. And, and I think most of my problems with, with, with politicians came from my saying out that we were not taking those steps and we were placing the country on the path to bankruptcy. So what happened? We spent, the, uh, before COVID, before 2020, we spent five years, four, five years, paying out trillions as petroleum subsidy at a time when oil price was low and government revenue was low. Now, when you pay all those trillions, what happens? You've still got to pay salaries. You've still got to do your infrastructure. You've still got to spend money. Um, and then you push in your debt limit. So you keep borrowing and you get to a point where 87% of your revenue, according to the World Bank, is being used to service debt and it's still not enough and then you put pressure on the central bank to print the money for you to monetize the deficit because the central bank cannot allow the government to collapse but the the, the reason the central bank has to fill the hole is because the government did not take the necessary but difficult political decision not to create that hole in the first place but when the central bank monetizes the deficit then you exert pressure on the exchange rate and on the rate of inflation and then the decisions become even more impossible because whereas you could have removed subsidy in 2015 and maybe be paying, what, 190 naira per litre? If you remove the subsidy today at current exchange rates, you may need to buy petrol at 380 or 400 naira per litre. So it looks even more impossible than in 2015, but it has been made more impossible because when we should have taken the decision, we did not. And, and, and I think for me, this is why I'm not too sympathetic uh, uh, to the administration. I think, the, I think the, the, the problems that we have were foreseen, they were foreseeable. Every economist would have told you that this is where we're going to end up on exchange rates. This is where we're going to end up with inflation. This is where we're going to end up with the fiscal position of government. You cannot continue um, digging a hole. You find yourself in a hole, you stop digging. But we found ourselves in a hole in 2015 and continued digging ourselves into a deeper hole. I think, for me, this was the source of my problems, saying it. Unfortunately, um, I've always said, I am not a problem. You, you can take me out, you can, you can kill me, you can jail me, you can, you can say anything about me. It will not change the numbers. It will not change the poverty levels. It will not change inflation. It will not change exchange rates. At the end of the day, you've got to implement the right policy. I don't care what you do to me, but just do the right thing. So we are in a difficult position, and, 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 and to be honest, we are today in an economic mess that is uh, far, far worse than we were uh, in 2015. I, I will say that part of the problem is that you've got a shortage of economists in government. Mm. When you sit in the Federal Executive Council, mm. you need some economists in the room. Mm. 
uh, in, in 2015, when the cabinet was, appoint was appointed, there were 36 ministers. Most of them were just lawyers. I mean, I have nothing against lawyers, but you have an economic crisis. But ask yourself, how many economists were in that government? I can't think of one. So I, th I think that um, we need debt relief. I think we need to do the belt tightening. And I think we need to send out clear signals that we've got to have a strong fiscal position. I really feel sorry for the governor of Central Bank. I feel sorry for the Minister of Finance. Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how I would cope if I was there uh, at, at, at this point in time. Very, very exciting insight you shared there. But looking back at your life, 60 years, you know, down the line, let's just take a panoramic view. You've transcended all. You've gone from being a corporate. Uh, boardroom titan to being a traditional religious leader and emir and you've, you've seen it all uh, to being an activist uh, an advocate I mean what would you say about your life in the next 60 years if you have a crystal ball and you want to look at the future what would be those things you'd like to do so uh, my plan I want to strengthen for example my fluency in French I want to do my PhD uh, in uh, in Islamic law. By strengthening French, Arabic, English, I move into being an African statesman. Hmm. Because with those languages, you're all over Africa, apart from the Portuguese-speaking countries. Uh, with the PhD and with the publications I'm making, I'm now working on a book on my central bank years. Uh, you begin to um, get into an academic life and continue to build a public intellectual life, continue as a public intellectual. The reason we celebrate being 60 is that I can see, I, I know many of my, ma of my mates and friends who've, who passed on <laughs> before this age, it could have been me. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you have that time, you make the best of the time. Uh, and I thank God that at 60, uh, my children and everybody can turn around and say, well, you know, this is someone who was a chief risk officer, who was a CEO, who was governor of Central Bank, who was Amir, who was Khalifa Tijan. And that's, um, I imagine that's more than many people achieve in, in many lifetimes. Um, and the only way you can do that is by not wasting your time uh, thinking about unimportant things like what may have happened in the past or who likes me or who does not like me and just focusing on who you want to be and how you can uh, make the best of yourself. Thank you so much. I mean, 60 years is about you running your race and in the end, it's about running your race and you know, doing it your own way. Thank you so much, Your Highness. Thank you so much for this time. Uh, thank you. Thank you.